So welcome uh, Fairfax County to your virtual plant clinic for today, April 1st. Um, April is the start of the great, really great wildflower blooming months. Uh, in Virginia, wildflowers uh, all throughout April into early May. Um, uh, and next slide, please, uh, Shirley. Uh, you might have heard of spring wildflowers being called ephemerals. Uh, which is kind of a beautiful soft spring word. Uh, it comes from the Greek ephemeros, meaning lasting a day uh, from the Greek word hemera. I think there's a goddess, hemera, the goddess of the day. Uh, it means short-lived, fleeting, or brief. So these flowers grow uh, under, the, sh under the, uh, the undergrowth of trees before the leaves have bloomed out because they need some sun to bloom. Uh, but they are uh, protected by the leaf litter, which gives them some warmth. So even if there's a brisk wind above, uh, they are cozy down in the leaf litter and can have enough sun and bloom in April into early May. Uh, next slide, Shirley. So I did some research to find out that uh, as, when Virginia was a colony, you know, the colonists came and saw all this new growth they had never seen in, in the old world. Uh, John Clayton was one of Virginia's earliest best known naturalists. He also became attorney general. And he wrote a book called Flora of Virginia back in the 1700s. Uh, and 250 years later, they updated it. So now they it's called Flora of Virginia. It's got its own website. Um, but this is a slide from the British Museum uh, where his collection is, is housed and that's a, uh, a, a pressed flower from the 1700s, 300 years old. So, um, and you can, this book is available also in app form. So you could put it on your phone or your iPad. Um, and if you read the reviews about it, many uh, ecologists, naturalists and botanists uh, really count it as a great resource. Uh, so that's our colonial naturalist, John Clayton, and you'll hear a little bit more about him later when we talk about spring beauties. Uh, next slide, please, Shirley. So where can you see these wildflowers? Um, there are lots of places. These are a few that I have, uh, you know, been to myself. Off the George Washington Parkway, you see an exit for Turkey Run. Um, there, there are wildflowers there. Um, Riverbend Park and also Scott's Bluff Nature Preserve in Great Falls. Uh, you can see these wildflowers. Uh, Bull Run Regional Park in Manassas is well known for carpets of bluebells um, in the spring. I remember going there one Mother's Day and I thought, well, we'll see a few uh, bluebells. And it was just the whole uh, forest floor was carpeted with bluebells. It was really memorable. Uh, there's also Thompson Wildlife Preserve out in Fauquier County. You need to go out 66 to, uh, I think it's Markham, Virginia, um, and lots of uh, wildflowers there, including my favorite, which is wild ginger, uh, which is hard to find. It kind of hides, but uh, it's there. But we're not talking about wild gin uh, ginger today. Um, also, uh, other places off the George Washington Parkway, um, Seneca Regional Park, Long Branch Nature Center in Arlington. Um, so we are lucky to live close to, uh, close to wildflowers here in suburban Virginia. Next slide, please, Shirley. So that's, uh, that's just a slide showing you what it looks like for the uh, exit off of the parkway for Turkey Run. Um, you know, I always wondered where that goes and I never took that exit, so I plan to. Um, next slide, please, Shirley. Um, so I wanted to mention there's a slide that didn't get it in here. I was at Wakefield Park uh, recently uh, in Annandale and uh, the pathways were covered with these little tiny yellow wildflowers. Um, I wish I you know, included this slide to show you. I thought, gosh, that's pretty. I wonder what that is. So I went and, uh, and uh, researched it and it's called, um, a fig, uh, anyway, it's Ficara verna, which is not native to this area. Uh, it's from Europe and Asia, and it was brought over with the landscape trade, um, and of course escaped cultivation into the and um, it it was brought to the landscape because it grows early. It grows in March, 
and um, you know, our, our ephemerals come out in April, early May. So I'm sure there was a lot of desire in snowy Virginia to start seeing some flowers in March. But um, these are invasive and I wonder how many spring beauties, bluebells, violets we could see instead of uh, Ficaria verna, the little yellow flower, if we had waited. So um, I'm gonna uh, go on and let my, uh, my master gardener colleagues, Carolyn and Deborah, tell you more about blueberries, I'm sorry, bluebells um, and violets and spring beauties. Well, Deborah talked to us about Virginia bluebells and spring beauties, and I love these two. Okay, Deborah. Thank you, Shirley and Susan. Uh, that was great. Um, and I agree. I love to talk about these two uh, wildflowers because they are named after our own state, the Virginia bluebells and the Virginia spring beauty. Uh, both are native to Fairfax County. Both are spring ephemeral as uh, Susan uh, describes, they're woodland perennials that emerge in early spring to flower and seed, and then they go dormant and disappear by the summer um, and pop up again the next spring. And my absolute favorite flower of all is Mertensia virginica. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great, which is the Virginia bluebell. Um, this flower is native to the eastern United States and found in moist woodlands, river banks, and floodplains like along the Potomac. Uh, unfortunately, it's threatened in much of its native range because of habitat destruction, but we're very lucky to have large numbers of these flowers in some of our local parks. I mean, as Susan mentioned, Riverbend Park in Great Falls is awesome. And Bull Run Regional Park in Centerville claims to have one of the largest stands of these bluebells in the entire country. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, when the leaves first emerge in the spring, in early spring, they are oval shaped and purple, but they quickly turn gray green in color. The leaves are two to in eight inches long. They form clumps two feet tall and a foot wide. And as I, we mentioned before, uh, the plant goes dormant, the leaves turn yellow and die completely to the ground by summer. So next, let's talk about these gorgeous flowers in the next slide. Absolutely gorgeous flowers. Um, they bloom April to May for about three weeks. They're lovely nodding clusters of bell-shaped flowers on coiled stems that straighten as the flowers open up. They're mostly sky blue to, bl to pink in color. And as you can see in the photos, the buds start out as pink. Then they turn blue when they open up. Then they turn pink again after they're fertilized. They're a very important pollinator plant for large numbers of insects, bumblebees, mason bees, long-tongued native bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, moths, nectar flies, all love this plant. So it's a great plant for your garden. So next, next slide, we'll talk about how to grow these plants. They're easily grown in shade in rich, moist garden soil that's well-drained and has a neutral to slightly acid pH. The fertilized flowers form seeds and they also spread through rhizomes which are underground rootstocks that send out shoots. Um, two big pluses about this plant is that the deer um, avoids the plant as well as rabbits. And they also are one of the few pl plants that grow uh, under black walnut trees. And this is a photo I took of a friend of mine. We were running at uh, Riverbend Park last April. You can see the flowers are everywhere. Uh, this season, the pink, the peak bloom time for bluebells is the middle of April, like the week of April 11th. So don't miss out on this spectacular show. So the next slide, we're gonna talk about another flower that's blooming right now. And that's a Clitonia virginica, which is the Virginia spring beauty, named after John Clayton, the famous botanist that Susan was talking about. This is another very delicate, beautiful flower that is one of the first flowers to bloom in the spring, blooms as early as February. 
It's native to moist woodlands and meadows in the mid-Atlantic region. And all the photos that you see of the spring beauty I took three weeks ago near my home at Runnymede Park in Herndon. So if you take the next slide, um, you'll see that in early spring, grass-like leaves emerge from the ground and the plant has to have two leaves in order to form a flower, as you can see in that second photo. Uh, then, it, like the bluebells, it goes dormant and disappears in the summer. And this plant stores food in what's called a corm, which is an underground swollen stem that looks like a bulb or a tuber. And it's very tasty to chipmunks and squirrels. Next slide. <clears throat> The flower is, appears from February to May in our area. It's delicate, white, star-shaped with pink veins and pink anthers. It's small, it's about a half inch wide. The flowers close at night and on cloudy days, and they form loose clusters of buds on the top of the stem. And you can see the clusters of buds in the first photo between the two flowers. It's a very, very important early pollinator plant because it provides lots of nectar when other flowers are just not around. <clears throat> and then in the next slide, growing the plant. <clears throat> it grows in well-drained, moist, acetic soil. It prefers partial shade, but it will tolerate full sun. It spreads by seeding or by multiplying corms and like the bluebell, the deer generally avoid it. So it's a great plant to grow in your yard, uh, in a rock garden, or to even naturalize in the lawn. You don't want to pull them out of the wild, uh, but you can buy the plants or the seeds online or at native plant sales. And so that's uh, my discussion of two gorgeous flowers and the resources I used. And the next slide was University of Wisconsin Horticultural Division and Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, Virginia Cooperative Extension. So Carolyn's gonna talk about another gorgeous wildflower, violets. Let's see if we have any questions about um, Virginia bluebells or spring beauties. Are there any questions in the chat box? Yes, I noticed someone was asking where to obtain these flowers and uh, Deborah just talked about um, you know, getting seed or plants uh, from a nursery. Uh, you don't want to collect them in the wild. Uh, you want to get them from uh, a, rep a nursery. Um, and, and I'm not sure, Deborah, do they grow best from seed or is it best to get plants? It's easier. Uh, they do readily reseed in under uh, ideal conditions so you can get the seed, but uh, some of your large nurseries are carrying the blue. Well, I have not seen any um, plants of spring beauty. There are some great native plant sales that are coming up. I gotta, I gotta um, tell you one in my local area, um, Friends of Running Mead Park is having a native plant sale April the 17th um, near, in downtown Herndon at the art space and they have a lot of native uh, plants. So these native plant sales that happen, um, you can get these, these plants, but you can also order them online but I've seen the bluebells in some of your bigger nurseries that carry perennials and native plants. Yes, I have too. And someone was asking, is there a nursery locally that carries these plants or seeds? So I, you know, I believe as part of our program, we can't recommend necessarily a particular commercial provider. Um, the, the native plant sales are held um, uh, you know, in the spring, um, and of course it's COVID and things are, are shut, but uh, I believe you can arrange to pick up things. Um, and uh, the Vir Virginia Native Plant Society, vnps.org, um, they will have a listing of local uh, native plant sales. Um, yeah. So you try there. And I know people are communicating in the chat with each other. So. Okay, Carolyn's going to talk to us about sure. violets. And a lot of people think this is a weed, but I have a lot of violets also in my woods and I think they're beautiful. So Carolyn, 
We're ready to hear about balance. Okay, thank you, Shirley. And uh, I'm kind of on the same page as you that um, they are charming, they're sweet, they're cheery. It's great to see them, you know, popping out now. And, um, and they seem to be pretty resilient with some of the ups and downs in weather we've been having lately. So um, just a, um, a quick introduction. Um, I am a first year intern um, through the Green Spring uh, Extension Master Gardener Program and did it virtually, um, you know, in the uh, September to December, 2020. It was an awesome experience. So I recognize Shirley, but I don't think anybody else. Um, so that was great. And um, just uh, in full transparency, I was borrowing somebody's um, uh, template, Steve Cooper from my class did a great job and I seem to have left a little of his name at the bottom. <laughs> but um, today we're going to be talking about uh, violets again in the spring uh, flower um, arena and we'll be talking about um, three in particular and that are native to the um, to the state. So can I have the next slide? Great, so we'll, um, we'll just talk about Quick background on violets in general, you know, historical type stuff. Talk about the general violet structure um, because it tends to be pretty similar across the three we're going to talk about. And the three we're gonna talk about um, are listed and they will be the um, viola, sororia, and I don't even know the right way to say this, is it just willed? <laughs> um, and it was named after a, a scientist in Germany the viola padata L, uh, and then the viola canadensis L variety canadensis. So I'm still learning how to work in all these um, Latin uh, names. So I will get there eventually, so bear with me. Um, so let's, let me see here. Um, uh, I think we I'm wanna go- I'm trying to go there, I'm kind of sorry. That's okay. I'm, I'm kind of all over the place myself. Now, is there um, another, the next slide, does it say background? Yeah, okay. So these um, violets uh, are found all over the world. There are about 400 plus species uh, globally. We have about 60 that are native to the U.S., two dozen um, species that are native to, um, to Virginia. And um, I think that they are so uh, prodigious in terms of how they're found everywhere because they are so uh, um, adjustable to a variety of landscape conditions. Um, now, because they can kind of live anywhere um, and, and, uh, and you can find them anywhere, we often find them in our landscape. We find them in our garden beds, we find them in our gardens, we find them in the middle of our you know, for those that want a pristine lawn, there's gonna be one happy bunch clump of them um, in there. And, uh, you know, I really uh, just see them as, as I, I don't see them as weeds, but again, anything we don't, that we don't wanna have around is considered a weed, even if it's <laughs> the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, let's see. Uh, they um, also uh, support native wildlife. Um, they are the violets are the only host for the great fritillary butterfly caterpillars. So if we did not have violets, we would not have that um, species of butterfly. Ants, birds, and mice eat the seeds. The caterpillars, the fritillary caterpillars and rabbits eat the leaves and specialized bees, butterflies, and moths drink the nectar. Um, and just from a historical uh, perspective, um, they had in the past, they were used, uh, had medicinal uses. They were used as a food source, although, you know, they have kind of a bland flavor. It would take a lot to really, um, fill you up, I think. Um, so they're used in salads. They, they, the pretty colors of them were used as food dyes. And, um, I, I think we probably all had a candied violet on a wedding cake somewhere <laughs> along the way uh, in our uh, socializing. Um, and historically, they would be um, um, symbolized innocence and modesty. Um, and the uh, Greeks and Romans and medieval Christians used them during celebrations, again, um, for, uh, you know, food and all those kinds of things. And then in Victorian times, I mean, I think a lot of you have probably heard of the language of flowers. And so in Victorian times, a white violet meant innocence, while a white, oh, I'm sorry, while a purple violet symbolized 
the giver's thoughts were occupied with love about the recipient. So it's all very charming and sweet and dainty and, um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, th these days, some people love them, some people look for every reason to get rid of them. Um, but, uh, okay, the next slide, please. Okay, the general structure, they're an herbaceous uh, perennial, they're low growing ground cover. Um, they rarely get more higher than ankle high. Um, they do come in a variety of colors. And this is kind of the, uh, the overall spectrum of, of, um, of violets, not just the three that we're gonna be talking about specifically, but you know, the, because they do come in violet, white, blue, yellow, you know, very pale violet, very dark violet. Um, the flowers and leaves um, are on separate stems. So you're not going to have a stem with a flower on it that also has a leaf on it. Um, the leaves tend to be heart-shaped and the flowers um, are interesting. They have um, two upper petals, two lateral petals. Um, and I think two of the three we're gonna talk today have uh, talk about today have uh, are bearded. Um, they have the white hairs on some of those lateral petals. And then the lower petal is considered a landing pad. It's marked in a way that brings, that attracts the, uh, the pollinators in and they land on it so they can uh, slurp the nectar. <laughs> and I found that kind of interesting. Um, they uh, all make seed pods, so um, they can spread through rhizomes and from pollination but they do all uh, create, uh, uh, generate seed pods as well. And um, they do all have a clumping nature. So you may see an individual, um, an individual rosette with some uh, flowers coming out of it, or you may see multiple rosettes um, uh, all together. Okay, um, let's see if I wanna add anything else on that. Um, and with those seed pods, I should add, it, they do do a popping, um, uh, a popping release. So when they're ready to go, all the seeds just pop out. Um, okay, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay. All righty, sorry about this. There was so much information, you know, I was like, how much information can there be about viruses? <laughs> there was way more than I thought. Um, but like I said, some of them do, uh, you know, do have similar things uh, going on with them. Um, the Viola sororia uh, wild um, has a couple of different names, common blue violet, dooryard violet, confederate violet, woolly blue violet, and, um, and you know, I, I have a couple of pictures to the right of the ones from my yard. And so you can see as they're starting to clump um, in that first picture, and then the picture to the right is the, um, the flower itself. And you can see kind of the striated uh, veined uh, bottom leaf that is gonna start bringing the, um, attracting the, uh, the critters in. Um, they can be found, you know, in woods, thickets, along roadways, um, in the woods, in bright sunlight. I mean, they do have a pretty um, hardy constitution. And um, it's the way it works is you have your flowers on top, the, the colorful ones, and then the ones that make the seeds, they are actually underneath the leaves and they do not, um, they do not open up and bloom per se. When they bloom, it's that's when they're shooting out their seeds. Um, so the viola pedata, uh, pedata L the, is called the bird's foot violet. And that's because as you can see, probably in that first picture, the left picture in that second row, um, the, the deep lobed leaves, they look like a little bird foot. And um, so that's um, a big differentiator compared to the, you know, all the other heart-shaped ones. Um, also, on this one, the, um, where's my notes page? Oh, sorry. 
I'll have it right next time. Um, the I think it's the anther in it. You always are going to have you know the the you know uh, lilac or violet colored leaves around it. You're also going to have um, the uh, orange anther in the middle. That's also going to be attracting the um, animals um, and the nature to this flower. Um, it's great in clumping. Lovely over long. Uh, pathways and all of that good stuff. And it does prefer uh, well-drained soils, sandy or gravelly is preferred. Um, and this is a, this one can grow up to eight inches high. And let's see. Yeah. Okay, and then the last one, the viola, viola, Canadensis um, is known as the Canada violet or the tall or white violet. Its leaves are um, a little bit different shape. They've got looks like some venation in them. And the they're smaller white flowers. These are the ones that really just you're not going to find them pretty much outside of uh, the more mountainous part of the state. Um, so they really do have a much more specific um, uh, area where they like to roam and, uh, you know, um, they don't spread by the runners. They really, you know, like rhizomes like some of the others did, it was, they do it uh, solely with seeds. And so this chart that I've put in, it, the formatting is a little wonky, but I was just trying to, the information about these three different um, species of violets, I try to just put in a different type of visual. So that you have kind of their habitat, their identifiers, how they reproduce, um, you know, and their species and common names all in one place as a quick reference tool. And let's see, I think, you know, and, and in closing, I think it's important to keep in mind, um, Doug Tallamy reported out in his book, Bringing Home Nature in 2009, that 29 species of leopard Deptera, if I said that correctly, the butterfly moth um, uh, uh, folks are dependent upon violets, uh, especially in these early uh, spring weeks. And as we said, the great fritillary would be going extinct if we did not have violets. But there are the other um, butterflies and moths, and as we said, bees too, that, uh, that really rely on uh, the early nectar of these flowers. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions if there are any or get back to somebody, um, you know, after the fact. Okay, are there any questions in the chat box? Um, I don't see any anything from our attendants. Um, I, I had a question about how it's so, in, or, or an observation that the landing pad seems to have like a, a white dot or something mm -hmm. as if it's trying to say, hey, land here, you know, like yeah. a it's landing like a, light. Like a runway. I'm almost yeah. kind of, you know, and some, I was, I was looking at it, a couple of them have the, um, the bearding, you know, the little tufts, the little hairs, and um, it, it, that is supposed to help uh, with um, some of the nectar and how the animals feed on it. But I was like, wow, I wish everything in life had something that clear <laughs> and, you know, a place for me to sit as I, you know, took everything in. But I thought that was a really neat thing. And, um, you know, those little nuances by nature are, uh, you know, pretty incredible. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the Canada violet, the white one. Yeah. I wonder why uh, the common name is Canada violet. Is it native here in Virginia? It, I mean, it is native, but in the in the um, Piedmont Mountain uh, areas only. So I think it likes the cooler, um, you know, some of the cooler <laughs> uh, temps, and um, and that, and I think, and they do better in, um, I think it's a certain mineral, I think on that last chart, it, it, there's something about the soil too that they like um, with a lot of dark mineral deposits and things like that. Oh, I see a lot of the dark purple here where I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so pretty, but I want to put on a warm coat and go outside and see if I see any of the bird's foot. 
a very different leaf structure. Yeah, I mean, I have, you know, maybe I've never looked close enough, but, you know, with any of these uh, workshops, you know, uh, there's always something now I'm looking for, and I didn't know I needed to look for it before, <laughs> so. Right, right. Um, I think they're really pretty, and rabbits do like to eat them. Mine are so pretty. And my garden area is fenced in because of the deer. We have a real deer problem. And um, it fences in a big sunny area and then part of my wooded area. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, of course, the deer can't get in. But rabbits can always find a way to get inside my deer fence. And for the first a few couple of weeks, the violets are beautiful, and then I've noticed the, the rabbits get smart, and the rabbits will eat them. Well, and, and to your point, Shirley, not seeing the deer, but I mean, your deer can't get in, but they really, violets are something that can give you the pops of color, and deer tend to just leave them alone. <laughs> it doesn't matter which variety. So, um, but you know, if it's not the deer, it's the rabbits, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, the rabbits are nice and let me enjoy them for a couple yeah. of weeks, and then they're flattened. <laughs> they're yeah. um, so I guess they're trying to share with me. 